So Eric Douglas with Corwald Fay Cursed King came second in Pound City 3. Now Tad Gibson is the actual winner with Rograk and Silias, but we already know so much about that deck, so who cares? Because it is very rare that we get to talk about Corvold. They actually got the exact same win rate, 5 wins and 4 failures basically, but the Rog Psydeck had 3 draws while the Corvold had 3 losses, and draws is a higher tiebreaker in tournaments. Regardless of that, let's take a look at the decklist. So we're down to a clean 15 creatures, Bird Paradise, Deathrite Shaman, Dockside, Dosen, Elsa Deep Shadow, Elvis Spirit Guide, Ignoble, Skurk Prospector, Simian Spirit Guide, Ruthless Technomancer, Ragavan, Orcish Lumberjack, Orcish Bowmaster, Mayhem Devil, and Tinderwall. Now Dockside is something of like a one card combo for Corwald, because whenever you sacrifice one of those treasures from Dockside, you get to draw a card. So you want to have a lot of tutors for it in various ways, like Final Fortune, Imp Seal. Unearth is a way to reanimate Dockside, because the plan is to sacrifice Dockside to something like Skurk Prospector, to send it to the grave, but then bring it back with something like Unearth, or as well as some of the Animate Dead and Necromancy, as well as Reanimate. But then we have Imperial Seal, Diabolic Intent, which is also a way to actually sacrifice Dockside, then find unnerfs to get it back. Demonic Tutor, Cooling Ritual to kill Dockside. We're also playing Adnos and Peer into the Abyss in the same decklist. And we're also playing Necropotence together with Final Fortune. There we have it. We don't have any of the Sorcery Speed red extra turn spells, we only go with Final Fortune and I think that's enough. But then we're also playing Underworld Breach, together with Lion's Eye Diamond and Grinding Station. There it is. The typical Corvold strategy. And you eventually kinda win the game with something like Mayhem Devil, uh, sometimes, if you're able to generate infinite treasures. But you can also win the game with Orcish Bowmaster, once you've basically drawn your entire deck, or not the, the entire deck, don't outdraw yourself, I'm gonna explain why. So you have Underworld Breach in play, you have a lot of mana, because you've been Lion's Eye Diamonding and the Grinding Station and such. Eventually you get your Orcish Bowmaster in play, and might even make a copy out of it. Now this deck can't make a copy, because we are not playing Cursed Mirror, nor Twin Flame. But, still, you can actually also reanimate some of your opponent's Dockside, uh, Orcish Bowmasters I mean, to have more Orcish Bowmasters, but then what you start doing is casting Wheel of Fortune over and over to, to basically kill everyone, utilizing the power of Underworld Bridge to do so. Now if you've been following my YouTube channel, you do know that I like to look into tournament data statistics and performance, so from a total of 201, tournament entries with Corvold, the entire group have achieved a 20.64 average win rate. But how good is that? Well, let's put it into perspective. Kinnan is sitting on a, from 1151 tournament entries, a 21.95. So it's a one and a half win rate higher. So Kinnan, Kinnan is doing a tiny bit better than Corvold. Atraxa is just below Kinnan, and you can see here, by the way, minus 2.41. That's how much the Atraxa win rate have been dropping since the start of this year. So Atraxa started somewhere around 23.82%, but it's been dropping down to 21.41. You're getting a little bit of a CDH uh, Commander TLS leaderboard update here, actually, as well. Monored Magda is sitting on 24.49, so she's doing better than Corvold. Timna and Kram is the most popular deck inside the entire format with 1,337, uh, with a win rate of 26.70, one of the best commanders currently in the format. One of the few with an average win rate higher than 25% as well. Now Yela is sitting on 23.45. And CC is on something of 26.83, currently the best win rate inside entire format, so far. But on the other hand, this is very equal to Tybna Krom. But then you have commanders that are much lower than Korvold, like Vinota, 16.28. Or something like Shorkai, Genesis Engine, 16.21. So that should kinda give you a feeling of uh, Korvold's current uh, CDH tier list position. It's not... Um... It's not among the top, definitely not. 
I would have to say that its uh, current position is uh, in the struggling area, so to say. But there are potential for detailed improvements and that's kind of the focus of this video, to look into specific cards and see how they are kind of performing. So here we have Food Chain and let me explain this picture. You see a pie chart of 33.3, which is like one third. So one third, a total of 67 decks have included Food Chain in their Corvold builds that they've brought to tournaments and they have achieved an average win rate of 18.82. You see a minus 1.82%, that's the, how much it has been dropping compared to the total average. So decks that contain food chain are performing a little bit weaker. Then we have this, Gaia's Cradle, and as you can see here, plus 3.88, that's how much the win rate have increased by the group of 36 tournament decks that did include Gaia's Cradle in their build. Because of this, we should immediately just jump over to crop rotation, that is also seeing a very good uh, improvement to the actual win rate. What we're trying to figure out here are recommended cards and uh, not so recommended cards. Now I have the win rate in green and red to see if it's actually doing a positive thing. So here we have Abrupt Decay that is in win rate red, which would indicate that it's a bad card for the core world build. But if you're looking up there, minus 0.06, it doesn't really have a huge impact at all. In the end, Abrupt Decay in your deck or outside of the deck doesn't really seem to matter. And looking around at various different cards, like Ad Nauseam, uh, same thing. It doesn't really seem to have a big impact in the actual win rate, if you're playing it or if you're not playing it. Even though the win rate is in green, plus 0 0.26, that's nothing. So we want to find a few cards that is boosting the win rate a little bit more, like Besiege the Mirror, a new tutor. Think about it, if you're casting a Demonic Tutor, you're finding Dockside, most of the case, like kind of always, kind of the case. Now, you have to pay two more mana, equals to four, to cast the Dockside Extortionist Pose Demonic Tutor. This is actually the same amount of mana, except that it's free black, which might make it tricky compared to black, red and two generic. But Dockside in Coreworld is still very key, so yeah, maybe this one is a go actually. Another thing to really point out that if someone has a Draenite Magistrate in play, you can't cast Coreworld and you can't do the Coreworld Dockside thing. But the One Ring has also sh Now, it's increasing the percentage win rate here by 0.84, so it's not a big deal, but Besiege the Mirror is a good tutor for the One Ring. And if you have your Corwold in play and you already have your Dockside in play, then Besiege the Mirror can sacrifice Dockside, which is something you want to do, to find a reanimation spell and bring it back. You're going to get a trigger from this when you bargain, and you're going to tutor for what you need. Speaking of sack outlets, Cooling the Weak to sacrifice Dockside seems to be good. Skirk Prospector is... Uh, ah, it's not really having a huge impact, it's boosting the win rate by... 0.52, but if you also take a look at that very high inclusion rate, two thirds of all Coral players are playing Skirk Prospector, which means it's going to get a average win rate closer to the total average, but the population of like a very popular card is indicating that it's a very good card as well. For example, Demonic Tutor is only boosting the win rate by 0.41, which is not that much, but it's sitting on a um, close to auto include, which means that, yeah, look, don't look at the win rate here. Look at how many people are playing it and say, yeah, we want to play this. This is a very interesting card, an Impulsive Pilferer. It's actually increasing the win rate by plus 2.33, which is a good boost we're looking for. It's definitely a little bit more compared to the total average, boosting it up to close to 23% win rate. And I can actually see why. When this thing dies, create a treasure token, which is on point with what you want. Now, if you have this in play, you have your core world in play, and you play something like Burnt Offering, similar to Cooling the Weak, also sitting on a pretty good boost to the win rate, then yeah, core world is going to draw a lot of cards with these two cards together. And this kind of showcased the pathway how Corvold have been developing. We've been moving away from the food chain combo and mainly moving more and more towards a 
Stormy variant, where you're basically casting permanence and sacrificing your permanence. Yand Storm, kinda cool. Going back to crop rotation, that is also sacrificing a land, giving you a card draw, finding that Gaia's Cradle. Now, if Gaia's Cradle only taps for like two, it's still a ritual. Like, crop rotation was one green mana, add two green mana, and draw a card. That's beautiful. Like, we're already playing Rite of Flame inside this build. Very good card. It's increasing the win rate a tiny bit. It's a great ritual. I play it myself in a lot of different decks now and then. Because one red mana to get two red mana is just very good to make sure you get your commander in play faster. But yeah, once you have your commander in play and you're starting the storm game plan, this is gonna help out too. And crop rotation is literally a better version than this. Tinder Wall is another great green ritual. Oh, yeah, it's a green ritual, but it's generating red mana. So you pay one green, you sacrifice this immediately for two red, and boom, you have made a ritual out of it. But also, if Corvald is in play, you get to draw a card as well. It's boosting the win rate by 2.42%. That's a good boost. Yule Lotus is uh, more or less an auto include. I was a little bit surprised about this one, Timur's Sabertooth. Now, I'm, I have to make a confession, I'm not a Corvold player myself, and in my belief, I thought that Timur's Sabertooth was good, because you could do that, Dockside ETB, use Timur's Sabertooth, return Dockside, generate infinite treasures, and then with Mayhem Devil, win the match. And you also get to draw out your entire decklist with Corvold. Now, you can bounce Corvold back to your hand, and you have assembled the combo of Tamer, Dockside, and Mayhem Devil together. But apparently this is not doing that great, like it's dropping the win rate by minus 3.42, which is a big change, honestly. And if we take a look at Mayhem Devil, it's dropping the win rate by 0.72, which is not really a big impact. As you can see here, there's a lot of decks that is playing Mayhem Devil, but not playing the Tamer Sabertooth. This is usually the finisher. It's a little bit of a hate bear, kinda, because your opponent's sacrificing of treasures is also going to trigger this thing as well. And then being your kinda wing con. Uh, not necessarily the only wing con, as I showcase an example with Wheel of Fortune and Orcish Bowmaster, you can win with Corvold without this thing. So I wouldn't look at this and say, Oh, the win rate is down by half a percent. It's uh, it's still a very high inclusion rate, and the drop isn't that big. But apparently, Tamer Sabertooth is uh, not doing a proper job. But speaking of those other potential win cons, that Orcish Bowmaster that I mentioned, together with Underworld Breach and Wheel of Fortune, just casting Wheel of Fortune over and over until your opponents have been archered down, seems to be having a good impact. Now, it's a very popular card, 72.1, and it's in boosting the win rate by close to 2%. So, yeah, seems to be a recommended card. Our champion was not playing Opposition Agent. I'm kind of surprised about this one. Now, here we have the perfect 50-50 split, more or less. We have a group that is not playing Opposition Agent, and we have a group that is playing the Opposition Agent. And the group that is playing the Opposition Agent is losing their win rate a little bit more compared to the other group. The difference isn't that huge, like 1.29%, but still it's something you maybe should consider thinking, having an extra thought about. Looking at the other mono black hate bear, Daffy Voidwalker, the anti graveyard that we don't like to have against us if we are playing Core Vault ourselves, but this is dropping the win rate by one point, one and a half percent basically, and I can actually see why. I've been looking at this card in other commander variants and you usually see that it's decreasing the win rate a tiny bit so it's one of yeah it's probably the best anti-graveyard cards inside the entire format but still it doesn't seem to be good enough i would like to argue that it's a cool card i have to like it and i enjoy having it myself but i have to admit that it's not a card i dream of drawing into the value that you gain from this is very limited. Now, once in a time, lifetime, like 1 in 20 games, you do get a Adnos stolen from one of your opponents, and that's great, but it's very rare. Like the best case scenario, the most usual scenario, it's ending up being just a counterspell. 
which is okay, but still, we're not trying to play police, we're trying to play win. This is a storm deck, and not a control deck, and uh, maybe Duffy Voidwalker isn't working out for the typical core world game plan. Speaking of core game plan, Necropotence is uh, boosting the win rate by 1%, so it seems to be a fine card, I would say. But if we actually take a look at the peer into the abyss, speaking of those uh, win condition aims, it's um, actually showcasing a very good performance. It's boosting the win rate by 2.89%, so it's very close at increasing it by 3%. Now, it's not that many Coral players that are actually playing it, but think about it. You're playing a very high amount of rituals, we've already looked at a bunch of them, like Dockside Extortionist is a ritual and it's your core game plan basically. If you're casting Dockside and someone destroys your core world with a Sword of Plowshare, I mean, this is something that is going to happen, you're gonna generate a lot of treasures, but without core world you don't have anything to do with them. Playing Peer into the Abyss makes you less commander dependent, and there are these Dranath Magistrates and all that other annoying stuff. So I would like to make a case for Peer into the Abyss, and also the champion decklist that we did take a look at was playing both Necro, Adnos and Peer in the same build. Wheel of Fortune has a pretty clean identical win rate, like plus 0.19 is nothing. So whether you play Wheel, don't play Wheel, it doesn't seem to have an impact. But if you're actually taking a look at the Wheel of Misfortune, it's increasing a tiny bit by 0.55%, which is also saying that if you play Wheel of Misfortune or not, doesn't seem to have an impact. But a small takeaway here, looking at two wheels basically, and looking at Wheel of Misfortune as well, is that more wheels might be good. I actually made a video looking into wheels more specifically, and the verdict from that entire video, looking at all variations of different commanders, was that wheels are in generally good. Ruthless Technomancer is increasing the win rate by 1.43. Now, by the way, this is a good potential replacement for Tamer Sabertooth. I will explain. So, you sacrifice X artifacts and pay 3 mana, return target creature card with power X or less from your graveyard to the battlefield, X can't be 0. So, you basically pay 4 treasures to bring back Doxad Extortionist from your graveyard. But now you're gonna say, we don't have a sack outlet. And I'm gonna say that you do. So you have Skurp Prospector to sacrifice your Dockside Extortionist. This is generating a mana and a Kadra for your commander. And then you're using Ruthless Technomancer to reanimate that Dockside. And you're using the red mana to pay for one of the two generics there. This means that if Dockside is generating four treasures, you're going infinite. The difference between this and Timur Sabertooth is that you have to generate five treasures to actually go infinite. But an also difference is that you don't need three different cards. In Ruthless Technomancer, Dockside and Skurk Prospector compared to Timur Sabertooth and Dockside. However, when Ruthless Technomancer enter the battlefield, you may sacrifice another creature. If you do, create a number of treasure tokens equal to that creature's power. So this is both generating treasures for you as well as Kadra with your commander. And hey, you could sacrifice your Korvold, actually. And when you do, you're going to generate a ton of treasures. You're not going to generate, well, actually, in the end, like if the Korvold's power is higher than the commander tax and Korvold's mana cost, then sacrificing your Korvold will be a ritual. Now, speaking of sack outlets, I found this win rate, Phyrexian Altar. It's increasing the win rate by 7.59% from 20 decks that have entered into tournaments with this in their core world builds. Basic inclu uh, inclusion rate of 13.4%. That's a big boost. Now, it's not uh, a super high sample size, 27 is uh, yeah, something. But it's kind of showcasing the importance of having sack outlets. This is basically a better version. I should also say more expensive version than Skurk Prospector. But it's kind of showcasing the, I mean, uh, direction you kind of want to be at. Ruthless Technomancer, great. Phyrexian Altar to help with that combo, basically, great. This also takes us to another great consideration sack outlet permanent, Goblin Bombardment. Sacrifice a creature, 
uh, sacrifice a yeah, sacrifice a creature, deal one damage to a target creature or player. This could be your finisher. So once you have established that infinite loop where you're sacrificing Dockside, reanimating it with Ruthless Technomancer, drawing your entire deck with Korvald, you sacrifice Korvald into this so you don't deck yourself, you cast Goblin Bombardment and then you have infinite damage, as well as potentially Mayhem Devil. Now the difference with Mayhem Devil and this is that Mayhem Devil is not really a sack outlet. So Goblin Bombardment is a little bit easier, so to say. And as you can see, it's uh, boosting the win rate by 4.17%. So yeah, that's, uh, that's a good thing. The, remember in the beginning of this video, when we were looking at a lot of different commanders with different win rates, and we're starting to see like average win rates that is up to above Nayela, so to say. So I want to emphasize strongly, just because you're seeing like, oh, Corval is sitting on a 20.64 average win rate, yeah, yes, sure. It's kind of giving you an average look of Corval's average performance. But you have to take into note that different Corval builds will perform differently. So there's definitely a picture I'm trying to showcase here where you're going for that storm, you're going for sacrifice, you're going for sacrifice loops to basically create a storm yand build. And yeah, we've seen a lot of different cards that could boost the average win rate quite high. I did not expect this endurance is increasing the win rate by 6.82%, taking it up to 27.46. An inclusion rate of 15%, basically 31 decks that have included it. You're going to generate a Corval trigger with this. You're going to protect your graveyard if you need to. I've heard arguments from some breach players saying that sometimes it's very good to protect your graveyard. But it's also a very good interaction versus various opponents trying to win with Fasa's Oracle or Undul Breach. And yeah, being able to interact with that is uh, quite important. So I believe that some people including this have been able to save their games, uh, kinda. But I think a big take here is that uh, once you're starting to like draw a lot of cards with your Dockside, you can actually use this interaction to draw cards with your Core World as well. You can you simply just cast it for no mana, exile a green card you don't care about, like a Dork, because the Dork is gonna suffering from summoning sickness on the same turn you're trying to win, and convert this into a card draw. Basically toss away two green cards for a card draw. That's good when you're trying to win and you don't need to interact. So don't just look at this like a, oh, it's a good interaction card. We need to play interaction. Yes, you need to, but you should try to utilize them to also be able to play for your storm strategy as well. Reign of Filth seems to be doing good for one black mana. Each land you control gains, sacrifice this land, add one red, add one black mana to your mana pool. A very good ritual together with Corvald because you can sacrifice all of your lands to draw a lot of cards and generate a lot of black mana. Who cares if you're going to like lose all of your lands, if you're still winning the game, then yeah, it's totally worth it. I hope this video have been giving you some ideas and inspiration for Corvald. And maybe even a motivation. Yes, it's not showcasing a great dominating performance. The overall win rate is around the struggling position, so to say. But I do believe that if you're building it more correctly, you could push this dragon's potential a little bit more. As I've showcased a few cards that were able to get a pretty good average win rate, around 23 to 24. In today's meta, we actually know a lot about the CDH format. A lot of things have been figured out and discovered, but there's still unexplored areas and small pockets of potential improvements. Regardless, thank you so much for watching. And a last shout out to Eric Douglas Taylor for coming second in Punt City. Take care guys, and I'll see you in the next video.